Hello everybody, today's video is going to be something different from me. It's going to be part review, part vlog, and all waffle. I am driving the new DS4. Not only is this a brand spanking new car, as in you can't actually even get a hold of one yet, but it's the first time I've actually driven a DS other than the original Citroen DS. Hard to believe, I know, but DS has now been split off from the Citroen mothership for seven years and is currently doing its own thing in its own way. Until now, I knew that it existed, but I couldn't really name many of their cars or how they were any different to Citroen. But this morning, I had a good chat with their UK MD, some of their people, and I now think I understand just a little bit better what it is they're trying to achieve. And I must say, thus far, I'm very, very impressed, if for no other reason than their ambition. Whenever you go on an event like this, the manufacturer will always tell you how their product compares with its direct rivals. And in the case of the DS4, that'd be something like the Mercedes A-Class, the Audi A3, the BMW 1 Series, and potentially the X2. But more interestingly than that, it's which other brands the company sees as a true rival. And for DS, they've name-checked companies you wouldn't expect, so they don't talk about how they fare against Audi or BM, despite those being probably their main rivals. They instead talk about how they fare against Lexus and Jaguar, because they're quite happy to be seen as the out there, the unusual, the alternative brand to people who've gotten tired of the way that the Germans do things. I believe the kind of typical DS customer is somebody maybe not unlike myself, who's had German cars and gotten a little bit tired of the fact that they aren't really that reliable anymore. They still don't want to give you anything as standard and they have become rather expensive and all just a little bit samey. DS really seems to exist as an answer to the question, why do we not have any more upmarket French car manufacturers. France as a country has a really rich and proud history, not just of car manufacturing, but in general luxury goods as a whole. There is an Aston Martin DBX, one of the first I've actually seen on the road. He's trying to power his way through the back roads of Surrey, no doubt a well-built company director, just going off to buy himself some bird's custard powder so he can prove to piston heads that he is, in fact, the owner. Anyway, DS is trying to take inspiration from the old, combine it with the best of the new, and produce something that is a genuine alternative. It is a real problem, I think, that all cars are becoming very much homogenous, and this is not that. So let's take a couple of steps back though and look at what this particular car is, how it exists in the lineup and what it does differently to its rivals. I've currently got a Polestar 2 on test and that's another kind of car that I think would appeal to the sort of person who's happy to get something a little bit different so long as it can justify its place. And the people at DS have been keen to emphasize, yes, they want to do things a little bit differently, but not different for difference sake. I have to say also that this particular car is a pre-production item, which explains why it's currently baking hot in here, even though I have the temperature set fairly low. There's a few things in here that aren't working yet or won't be working right, so it's not a 100% finished article. I'm hoping in the next few months or next year, I'll be able to do a more in-depth review where I'll talk you through the car in more detail. However, what I want to give you today is more broad strokes, give you an idea as to whether this could be the sort of thing that appeals to you. So. The DS4, as they call it, a hatchback, but really it's a kind of crossover type thing. To confuse matters, this is the DS4 Cross. Uh, of course, the man with the Aston has electric gates. Yeah, a must have in this area if you want your neighbors to respect you even the littlest bit. Where was I? To confuse matters, this is a DS4 Cross. The DS4 comes in three key flavors. The DS4, the DS4 Performance Line, and the DS4 Cross. They're all actually the same shape. Some stylistic tricks have tried to make this look a little bit more like a crossover, but the fact is, it's not actually any different to the others. My personal preference would probably be for the DS4, not the performance line. I'll get on to why in a little bit. These will be available from about 25,000 pounds up to around about 40 grand. This is a fairly highly specified one. It's a DS4 Rivoli with the Opera package, which gives it some extra bits. Exactly what? Well, there's the leather in here, a few other bits of trim and that, but this is the sort of stuff I want to go into in more depth in a DS4 specific video. I have this car only for a very, very brief amount of time, so I want to give you the, the big picture. 
there will be an all-electric DS4, however, at present, that does not exist. The closest you'll get is the e 225, which is available with several of the trim levels. So that's a 1.6-litre turbocharged four-cylinder engine combined with a plug-in hybrid system, getting you 225 horsepower. There is also a 225 horsepower all-petrol engine for those who don't care about the hybrid bit. Unfortunately, because a lot of people have been driving this car today, when I got in it, it had only a little bit of hybrid range left and it wanted to use the battery pretty quickly didn't really want to turn the engine on at all in normal mode so I've now got no range left there is a little bit of battery power left but that's about it not enough to drive on pure electric anymore you can also get a diesel still it's a 130 horsepower engine and is available only in the sort of lower trim levels but fleet customers apparently are still interested in those DS don't really see itself as a sort of fleet-orientated company, although they will provide those options. They see themselves more as a retail, you know, end-user-facing kind of business. To that end, although they do now have a way of buying a car online and even arranging a test drive from your own home, they still are investing in real physical retail locations. You have what's called the DS Salon, which will exist inside a larger dealership, usually a Citroen, and you also have the DS Store, which is just a DS dealer. There's about 27 of those at the moment, and they're aiming to get it to about 40 or so in the near future. So that, I think, is about the right number of dealerships to have around the country. What's really impressed me with DS and the, the launch and everything that they've said is the customer focus that they have. For this reason, I'd love people that have bought a DS to pop into the comment section and give me your real-world feedback on what the experience has actually been like, to see how it matches up with what they say they are delivering. And what they want to do really is give people a reason to buy their cars that isn't just because the car itself is good. So they have something they call the DS Privilege Club. This means if you buy a DS several times a year, you just get invited to nice things. Like for example, they organize for people to watch the Formula E, which they've won a couple of years now, from a nice location where you can get wined and dined all on DS's payroll. So you get the sort of real premium experience that even other big manufacturers would make you pay for. You don't really get an awful lot for free if you go and buy a Porsche. You get invites to stuff, but most of it you still have to pay for. That, I think, is very, very clever. It gives people a reason to use the car. It gives people a reason to buy another one. It's a value-added thing that I think is probably of even more importance now to people than what the Euro NCAP rating is or how many litres of boot space you get. Incidentally, as far as Euro NCAP goes with this car, I have no idea, but it's packed with many, many safety features that are now more or less essential. So you've got all your collision avoidance, lane keep, and when this car launches, or soon after, you'll have a new set of driving assist systems which will give it not fully autonomous, but semi-autonomous driving capabilities. So it will be able to drive itself on the motorway, and with the press of the indicator stalk, it will also change lanes on its own. Currently, that functionality is not enabled here because it's still in development. Compared with the Toyota Corolla that I had recently, yes, it's a larger car, but boot space is also notably improved. It's not quite as good as the Polestar 2. I think that car benefits from being a pure electric vehicle. This obviously is somewhat of a compromise, but it's a decent size. Rear seat space is a little bit on the cramped side, and I would say if you are a tall family, this may not be quite big enough for your needs, but your mileage may vary. Again, why don't you give them a call, get a car sent to your house where you can test drive it. How easy is that? The good people at DS are very proud of how stylish yet practical their cars are, both outside and in, and I say they're right to be so. The exterior, I would say, looks to me more Japanese rather than European or American, with its harsh edges and creased lines, but it's got a really distinct look about it, and because they're inspired by Paris, the city of lights, the thing is covered in reflective surfaces, clever patterning, and some funky LEDs at the front. In fact, the daylight running lights are made up of 98 individual LEDs. Mm -hmm fun fact for you. If you ever want a fun drinking game of an evening, by the way, whenever a new car launch happens, go and watch all the videos about it and see how many times the journos trot out the exact same stats. The reason being that we've all sat through the same presentation. So if anybody else says the daylight running lights have 98 LEDs in them, have a swig of your Diet Coke. Don't drink and drive, kids. Now, while the exterior may be quite stylish and appealing, I don't think it's really enough to sell this car. The interior is a very, very different matter. It's absolutely stunning. I would nearly go as far as to use the word 
opulent. As I'm on my own for this trip today, I'll be mixing in some of my own footage and also that provided to me by DS. And I'll be deliberately giving you cars that look a little bit different to this one so you can see the different options available. There are about three trim levels. Your base one is Bastille, then you've got Trocadero, and then you have Rivoli. I keep calling it Tivoli, it's not, it's Rivoli, not Tivoli. Above that, you've then got the Opera, which this one is. That gets you even nicer, Napa leather. And look at the amount of leather in here. This is all leather. Look at this shape here. That's, again, very sort of lexus -y piece of design. Leather here, leather here, leather here, leather here, leather here. The headlining's maybe a little bit on the plain side. That's perhaps the only bit of the interior that sort of lets it down. There's a Focal stereo in here, which is actually really quite good. Again, for this class of car, very, very nice. All the switch gear is really cool too. I mean, look at this. This is a work of art. I'm currently driving that Polestar about, and that is still using, for its window switches, really, really old Ford parts. They're 20-year-old Ford parts that are in Jaguars sort of about 16, 17 years ago. And for a car that's supposed to be all about the future, I don't know, it's just not good enough. Whereas in here, I can't spot a single piece of interior trim that I recognize from any other manufacturer. The steering wheel is quite small and nice in the hand, and unlike some others, they haven't decided to go the route of sort of touch sensitive pads and things like that for the steering wheel or many of the other controls here. You've got a touchpad down here, and of course the main screen up here is touch as well. But what DS want you to do is customize it to your own requirements. So everything is set up that really when you buy the car, what you do is spend half an hour going through all the things you're going to use frequently, and you can assign hotkeys to them, which are not actually that bad. There are at least physical hotkeys here, which will get you to your climate control screen. You can also turn the volume up and down easily from either the wheel here or on the steering wheel itself. You've also got Android Auto and Apple CarPlay. They're wireless, by the way. And if you want to use the inbuilt navigation, it's actually pretty damn good. There were a couple of items which DS were very, very proud of, clearly, and they wanted to really hammer home that was slightly odd. The first being that they have bigger wheels than the Germans will give you for the same money. So this is sitting on 20s, and they have flush door handles. Very, very proud of their flush door handles. It's not the only car I've seen with them, it's quite trendy now, but they, they like their door handles. And that AC is definitely on the blink because it keeps getting warm. Whenever I set it to, it goes cold for two minutes, then just goes hot again. But pre-production car, there's still a few months away from first deliveries, so I'm sure that will all be sorted. But despite the big boots it's wearing, this car does channel the spirit of the original DS in one very important way. Ride quality is utterly superb. It is no exaggeration to say that this car gives me the real feel in terms of interior materials and ride quality of a premium luxury saloon from only a few years ago. Honestly, comparisons with something like a Mercedes S-Class or a Lexus are not that far-fetched. Granted, the newer versions of those cars push things on even more, but for 40 grand, this thing is stunning. The suspension is particularly trick. It uses a system, not unlike some others, where it scans the road ahead for lumps and bumps so it knows what's coming and can adapt to suit. Oh, I appear to have found Long Gross Studios. A lot of car reviews filmed here. Uh, a lot of car reviews. You even get, in this particular car, as standard, certain things that weren't even options a couple of grades higher only a few years ago. So, you've got double glazing. You've got front and rear parking sensors and 360 degree camera. You've even got both heated and ventilated seats. Yep, my back's currently nice and chilly cool because this seat has fans in it to keep you cool in summer. Now that, in a small family car, is mega. That's really, really trick. But, and there's always a but, isn't there? This is not a car without flaws, and it does have one great big massive one. If you want to do anything remotely approaching sporty driving, it's useless. For this kind of stuff, for the Surrey bimbling about, the daily driving, the taking the kids to school, the going and doing the shopping, just popping out, even heading up to Scotland, doing a longer trip, this is an absolutely sensational thing. But when you want to really have some fun, when you want to chuck it round a bend, it's useless. It's got driving modes, 
put it into sport and like all of the others in the DS4 range it has an 8-speed automatic gearbox. I can't hear the engine so I don't know when to change. There is a rev counter but it's an item that DS don't think you need all the time so it's on one of the customizable screens. Granted, fairly easy to access, just press a button here a few times and you'll find it. But, seriously, this car, manual mode, no good. It feels weird, it feels wrong, it's not that quick and the steering just does not work when you want to chuck this thing around a bend. The car feels very unhappy with everything. Yeah, it's just a little bit odd. It doesn't feel particularly confidence inspiring. It's still reasonably smooth, although it's now got this added kind of judder and shake because you're in sports mode. It's disabled all the clever computer controlled suspension stuff. And um, yeah. It's not particularly happy. Now, I don't know exactly where I am, but there's a good little bend coming up here to test the car on. We should be able to go around it at a fair lick. But, see again, I just don't know what I'm doing. Yeah, yep. Suspension does not talk to me. Nearly spilled my Diet Coke. I've got absolutely zero confidence in the chassis on this car. None. So, I'm gonna do the only sensible thing and put it back into comfort mode. In honesty, I expected there to be a lot more crossover between this and the Polestar than there actually is. You see, that's all electric and is sort of more expensive, so that starts where this kind of finishes. So this is 40 grand for the best one, whereas Polestar is 40 grand for the cheapest one. However, they couldn't be more different had they tried. That car is brilliant when you're absolutely caning it, and the rest of the time, mm, it does struggle. I think that's how that particular one is set up, so wait for the review on that. But here, when you're doing the normal daily driver bit, it's genuinely excellent, absolutely spectacular. It's just when you try and ask more of it that it goes, sorry, that's not my bag. And that's a shame because I have a petrol head, I do love chucking a car around, and if this were able to do that, as well as it does the rest of things, it would be, I would say, one of the best cars on sale today. Instead, it just has to be content with being one of the best daily drivable cars on sale today. Not that you can actually get one today, but you'll be able to get one soon. So that I think is really enough from me for now. I hope this has given you a little bit of an insight, not only into the DS4, but also the DS brand as a whole. They got in touch with me a, a few months ago and asked if I wanted to work with them, and I'm really, really glad that I've been able to get on an event before I've had a long-term press card to understand a little bit more about who they are, what they're doing, what they're trying to accomplish. And it does mean you get to talk to the people, understand the brand a little bit better, where they're positioning the company, what they're trying to achieve. And, and I have to say, thus far, I am really, genuinely very impressed not just with the car but with the company as well it's far more different to Citroen and everything else in honesty than I expected it to be I thought it was just going to be sort of well it's Citroen with bells on but no it's actually quite distinct and I think all the better for it oh pulling out roundabouts visibility visibility in here is is okay uh not great big b pillar like a lot of modern cars and I am on the wrong side of it which is not helping because your rear three quarters is is not great so there we have it. That's all from me for today. Thank you for watching. Please like, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.